Thank you very much for giving me opportunity to speak here about uh, our work. Okay, so you've seen already this image. Uh, it's a very introductory lecture when you see the baby chimpanzee and the adult chimpanzee. And when you heard already from the previous talks, one clear difference is uh, uh, facial features of the baby chimpanzee much more resemble our human features than uh, if you look at the adult. Basically, baby chimpanzee looks much more human-like and more cute. And it's also, of course, reflected in the uh, brain features and the cranial, no, in the cranial features, sorry, not in the brain features, when you basically can say what the skull of the human, adult human, resembles the skull of the baby chimpanzee when the adult chimpanzee is completely different. Uh, but what is interesting for us, not really how it is in terms of the skull, but the content of the skull in terms of brain. We're interested, are human brains childlike? Or in the other words, if we say, if we look at the human brain of adult human, is it in any way similar to the brain of the baby chimpanzee? But how can we, basically, how can we address this issue? Can we look into the brain and see if any of the features of the brain, of the, our adult human brain, resemble baby chimpanzee brain? Yes, we can. In fact, uh, molecular biology gives us many tools to look inside the brain. One of the easiest way to look at what's happening in the brain is look at the expression of the gene, gene activity, also called gene expression, because we know brain, as any other human organ, consists of cells which have a human DNA. But DNA is the same in all tissues. Our liver, our kidney, our brain all have the same DNA. What is important, what parts of DNA is which genes are activated and transcribed and make RNA, which in terms will make proteins. So basically, we can look at the activity of the genes in particular brain regions, in particular cells, in particular um, stages of development, and see if the human brain expression somehow special or similar to expression of the baby chimps. If we do this, if we simply take a piece of brain from different brains of different age, we can look at the particular brain area here, its prefrontal cortex, the brain area which is involved in uh, basically cognitive control of many things what we do. We see what actually uh, gene activity in the brain is incredibly dynamic. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't stand in one place. So what you see here is the groups of genes, about basically thousands of genes on the human brain, all change their activity with age. Here you have age, and it's different groups of genes. And here you have age from newborn to about 100 years. And you can see, for instance, for this group of genes, the uh, activity, which is on y-axis, goes up over age. So when you or me were born, activity of those genes was very low, and then it's increasing, increasing, increasing until the very old age, until we're 100 years old. For these genes, for instance, it's opposite pattern. The activity decreases with life. Here we see genes which were kind of low active in the newborn babies, and when we were young, children, maybe teenagers, it was very high, and then it's decreasing with age. You cannot maybe see the uh, ages, but this would be about 10, 15 years of age, and then it decrease. If you're 40, you are somewhere here. If you're 80, somewhere here. But what does it all mean? Um, we see a lot of different functions, of course, uh, changing their activity. But what is it more interesting for us, what we can do to simplify this question is simply looking at the changes which are specific to humans. So we can compare the patterns of gene activity in the human brain to patterns of gene activity in the chimpanzee brain and macaque brain during the development and find what is special to humans. You can say, why do we need to look at the macaques? Because basically we said we only need to find out if the adult human brain is similar to the baby chimpanzee brain. But imagine a situation when we see what human is, adult human is indeed similar to baby chimpanzee brain, but also adult macaque, for some reason, is also similar to the baby chimpanzee. Then it would mean what human and macaque brain actually show the same type of uh, neoteny. It would be much more hard, much harder to interpret than if we see this picture specific to human and macaque doesn't show any such trait. So we really want to focus on this very short evolutionary lineage of about maybe six to eight million years when humans, our ancestors, separated from the common ancestors of the humans and chimpanzees.
And of course, because it's uh, such a short evolutionary time, we can expect that there will be very few molecular changes, developmental changes. So it would be easier for us to study them. So how this kind of study is done is very simple. Uh, we collect tissue from brains, from prefrontal cortex, cerebellum from uh, humans, chimpanzees and macaques for different age. And we can measure gene expression using molecular biology methods. And then we can see how many genes are there show with human specific or chimpanzee specific or macaque specific patterns. And what we see what actually in prefrontal cortex, but not in cerebellum, which is involved more in motor coordination, there's really a large number of this kind of human specific developmental changes. Around 700 genes show this kind of pattern. In cerebellum, it's less. And in chimpanzee, you basically find very few, which is reasonable because in six to eight million years, you hardly expect any kind of developmental change. But in human, you do find it. So basically, now we can see what kind of genes are affected and what do these genes do. Uh, we can take all the 700 genes and cluster them in different clusters using just similarity of gene expression. It's not very important, it's just some kind of methodological method, a methodological way to deal with all this data. And then what we get is this kind of gene groups all sharing similar expression patterns. For instance, this is human developmental curve. You can see genes follow this kind of trajectory. And chimpanzee and macaques here in blue and green show completely different developmental trajectories. So you can see this is a clear human-specific patterns. And then we can ask what kind of Functions they do, it's a big table. Again, you don't need to read it. Most important what here immediately already for the very first group, for this group of genes, we see the functions related to the uh, long-term potentiation, signal transduction, cell communication, calcium signaling. Basically, all these functions relate to how our neurons in our brains communicate with each other. So our brains is basically consist of trillions of this kind of brain cells, neurons. But what is important is not really the neurons themselves, but how they connect, how they communicate with each other. You can imagine brain is some kind of, well, governmental building. And every neuron is uh, maybe as an employee, as some kind of clerk sitting in the office. But if they cannot communicate with each other, if they cannot call or email or send messages or simply fax a document to each other, you know, nothing will happen. You, you, they, you give them documents, it has to go from one office to another. And similar things happen in our brain. So we, our neurons in our brain, they all have to communicate through the uh, little things here, the synopsis, which are sitting like some little leaves on the branches. And this is the way how we can use our brain and how thoughts and memories and other things are formed. That's what at least people uh, currently think. And if you look at this pattern, it doesn't really look as a neotenic pattern because you have very different curve in the human brain. This is human expression. This is age. Uh, each dot represents an individual, which we measured gene activity. And this is uh, sum of uh, about 200 genes, which we call the module one genes because they all have the same gene expression pattern. And this is the expression patterns of chimpanzee in blue and macaque. Seems completely different. So can we really call it neotenic? But if we measure the macaque samples from newborns and from the fetal stages, then we see what actually before birth, the macaque activity of genes resembled the activity of genes which happened in the baby human brain after birth during the first five years of life. So this is fetal samples. This is already after, after birth. So actually, you can see the macaque curve and human curve are very similar. They just shifted in terms of time. And probably chimpanzee curve is also very similar, but we, of course, cannot get any fetal chimpanzee samples for our study. So if we're talking about the change of timing, it's basically what we call neoteny. Neoteny is uh, uh, some features of the juvenile, juvenile uh, chimpanzees and macaque present in adult humans. But is it really true? Can we really call it uh, neotenic? 
Uh, here, based on this expression curves, we have an advantage. We don't need to guess what kind of age of human corresponds to what kind of age of chimpanzee. Because, for instance, if you have a dog, you know, if you have a three-year-old dog, you say, how old is your dog? And then you have to maybe multiply by cell and say, oh, it's something like 21 years old. But here, you can simply look at the expression curves of the chimpanzee and human, align them, and then, based on gene expression, you can know what kind of age of human corresponds to what kind of what, what age in chimpanzee based on expression of genes. And if we take all genes, which is signified by this blue curve, and this is chimpanzee age in years after conception, and this is birth time, chimpanzee, human, macaque, and this is human age in years. And you can see if you look at the all genes, when chimpanzee is born, so we can look at the this blue curve and see the human age would be about one and a half years. But for the red curve, which is model one genes, which genes which control the synaptic connections, the connections between neurons, you can see it would be much higher age. It would be somewhere here, around five years of age. And then we can go through this curve and see one-year-old chimpanzee for all genes, it corresponds to two-year-old human, but for model one genes, it's already 10 years old. And uh, for the uh, chimpanzee age uh, two, for all genes, it corresponds to three and a half, but for the model one, it's already 15 years, uh, and so on. And you can see, basically, then, um, even if you're eight years old, for the model one, it's, uh, for all genes, it's just 30-year-old human, and for the uh, chimpanzee age, 20. So, in reality, all genes just represent the shift between the human development and chimpanzee development, because we know the sexual maturation is uh, slow, um, later happening, so basically around this age, in chimpanzee you have sexual maturity around 10, uh, in uh, human it's around 16, so basically it fits to what we expect, but model one is much shifted. So, it shifted towards, seems like, old age, but what it means, what actually, in the eight-year-old expression, it just corresponds to 30-year-old human or 20-year-old chimpanzee. So, it is basically near any case when you um, eight-year-old, you have an expression corresponding to, for this particular gene, it's just a 30-year-old human. Uh, so, what I said, is uh, related to gene expression, but what I said was gene expression is supposed to control the synaptic connections. And uh, we can look directly at synaptic connections using the uh, electron microscopy. So this is what we see. If we look at the electron microscope, this is the scheme of how synaptic connections look. And basically, you see this kind of dark patches, which corresponds to the membrane. And we can see if this kind of uh, human-specific shift, the delay, the atenic delay, also can be seen in the level of synaptic connections, so directly on the level of the phenotype of the brain. Uh, it's done very simply. One does this electron microscopy picture and just counts how many membranes are there. And this uh, work was done before in human and macaques, so people knew what there is difference between humans and macaques. In humans and macaques, uh, when we are born, there are very few mature synaptic connections. But in humans, the peak of synaptic density is achieved much later, around five to 10 years of age. And in macaques, it's within the few half a year of life. So you can see humans have much longer window to form the connections in the brain compared to the macaques. In macaques, already after half a year, the brain is basically fixed. All the connections are made, and synaptic pruning starts to take place. Uh, we repeated this experiment in our lab. Basically, we got very similar curve for macaques, a little bit more ugly curve for human, but uh, still different from macaque curve. But nobody looked at the chimpanzee, so according to our hypothesis, this process should be specific to human, and chimpanzee should look very much like macaques. And indeed, this is the case. So when we add the chimpanzee samples, we see chimpanzee samples curve, although based on few individuals, it looks like uh, macaque curve is a green curve and very different from the human curve. So this uh, neotenic process is not only seen on the gene expression level, but it also affects how the synapses are formed in the brain. So we can summarize it in this kind of uh, picture. Basically, say this is a, a synaptic gene expression where we see this neotenic shift. And when I was saying eight-year-old humans correspond to 20-year-old chimpanzee, you can see it just simply because uh, you can project it here. And uh, 
It means what uh, uh, when we're old in uh, our brain activity is still young for this process. And this is not only gene expression, it's also in synopsis, or, or also we only measure it in the young individuals. We don't have any old individuals here. But how we can test the functional significance of this? Basically, if it would be in a model organism, in a mouse, then we would say we simply need to disrupt this process and see what are the consequences. Uh, you kill this process in the mouse using some kind of knockdown or some other ways and see what happens to the mouse brain. Can it, uh, what kind of function it lose or gain if you enhance this function. But in human, of course, we cannot do such experiment. But in humans, we have uh, loss of functions happen naturally. We call it diseases. So we can call, look at disease, which cause loss of function uh, for human cognitive ability, especially for uh, maybe social abilities, and see if it leads to disruption of synaptic neoteny. And there is such disease. It's autism. So if we talk about autism, then one of the effects of autism is really disruption of social cognition. So social cognition fails to develop in autistic patients. And our hypothesis is what in autism, this kind of neotenic shift in synaptogenesis will be disrupted. And this is data what I showed you before. And this is what you see if you add, basically repeat the experiment, but also add human autism cases. And you can see, indeed, the autistic curve here in black is dramatically different from the healthy human developmental curve. It basically falls back into this ancestral pattern of development. And the same you see for synaptic connections, although you cannot measure it at the early ages because we can only diagnose it from two years of age. But basically, you can see what dramatic disruption of the, this neotenic pattern. And this is all I have. So for the summary, take home messages, there is no whole brain neoteny. So neotenic changes are restricted to specific processes in specific brain regions. So as I said, if we look at all genes expressed in brain, then uh, we don't see any neotenic shift. But for particular processes, such as expression, genes controlling synaptic, <coughs> synaptic development, we indeed see neotenic shift. And disruption of neotenic development may lead to loss of social cognition, which we saw in the case of autism. That's all. Thank you very much.